Our Father, we thank you for bringing us to the conclusion and the end of this year's Congress. We thank you for the various things you have pointed out in our lives. Thank you for all the instructions and the encouragements. We're praying, O oh Lord, as we'll be going back home, that everything you've done in us and for us here will take back with us. So that the same thing you will do through us for other people in Jesus' name. We pray that as we go, we'll keep on looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we pray, Lord, that as we have set the standard, the model, the pattern for us, we will follow in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you will make us effective representatives of yours everywhere we go in Jesus' name. And help us so that as we do the work and as we minister, we'll do everything as unto the Lord. Speak to every heart now. In Jesus' name we pray. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 2, we have the first three words looking unto Jesus. As the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews brings the epistle almost to a close, to a conclusion, he wants to inspire the readers to constancy, to perseverance, endurance, patience, consecration, and self-denial, so that between the time of reading that epistle and the time they see the Lord face to face, they will be able to run the race that is set before them. And as you look at the word of God, this is what you'll find every faithful minister doing, either at the end of their lives or at the end of the message they're giving to the people of God. At the end, they're always wanting to call the believers to steadfastness and to determination to endure till the very end. And you will see that this is a fitting conclusion for our Congress this year, encouraging ourselves to be looking unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that verse again, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You might have noticed that the way the sentence is constructed, you don't start a sentence that way. You don't start by just a begin and saying, looking on to. If you talk like that, it's like you've been saying something before. And from what you have said before, you now want to continue. And you said, because of this, because of this, that is so then now looking on to. That then will take us back to verse 1. Wherefore? Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Actually, the writer is pointing us back to a cloud of witnesses. It says we are encompassed, we are surrounded by the encouragement, by the lifestyle, by the endurance, 
by the dependence on God, by the faithfulness of a cloud of witnesses. It's referring actually back to the old covenant. And it's referring to the catalog of heroes of faith that he had pointed out in chapter 11. He goes right back to the time before the patriarchs and goes to the time of the patriarchs and he goes to the time of the prophets and he goes to the time of the law and he comes to the end of the old covenant. He begins by opening our mind to people like Abel and the people like Enoch and people like Noah and people like Sarah and people like Abraham and people like Isaac and even people like Jacob and people like Joseph and then he comes to people like Moses. And then he talks about even the Jericho walls that fell. Talked about the faith of Rahab. Talked about Barak and Gideon and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. Then he stops mentioning names. Now he continues by saying the people, I don't want to continue mentioning names. Let me tell you what he did by faith. They subdued kingdoms and they wrought righteousness. They obtained the promises, they stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire, they escaped the edge of the sword. And he talks about women as well. He talks about the people that were sown asunder and the people that were so stoned. And then as he concludes that, he said, I've told you about a number of people. Now I want to lift up the champion of them all, the incomparable one, the supernatural one, the Christ and the Messiah. It says, although you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, now I present unto you the very author and the very foundation and the very perfecter of our faith, looking unto Jesus. It says, you would have got a lot of blessings, a lot of encouragement, from the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, I showed you, but it should in case there is still something missing that you have not got, that you need for your encouragement so that you'll be able to persevere unto the end. Look unto Jesus. Now, as he talks about looking unto Jesus, he had already prefaced that with all these people and then it says, there is something we need to do. As a result of all the heroes of faith, all the examples, all the challenges we have got from them. It says in verse 1, let us, then it says something. And before he finishes that verse, he says, let us. Now before I go into the text itself. I need to show you that anytime you come across those two words in the epistle to the Hebrews, the apostle is about to say something witty, something unforgettable, something very essential to your very faith and to your very life. That will not be the first time he uses those two words, let us, and then what will follow will be something that is very, very important. Run quickly with me. Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. He had said some things in chapter 3. That if you keep on holding on, then as you hold on your confidence to the very end, will you be able to enjoy and rejoice in that home firm to the end. And now he says, as a result of that, and looking at the examples of those who are falling by the way, especially in the wilderness, let us therefore fear. And then in chapter 4, verse 11, let us, again, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Whenever the writer of Hebrews says, let us watch for what follows. It says something important you shouldn't forget. And here it says, let us labor to enter into the rest. Because some people that ought to have entered into the rest did not enter into the rest. In chapter 6 verse 1, therefore, 
leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us, let us go on unto perfection. You see here, he's been uh, talking about the principles. And he's uh, even wanting to talk about the baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection and the eternal judgment. And then he says, let us leave all those principles. We have settled them. We cannot be confused about them anymore. Don't let us remain in the kindergarten. Let us move on and go on unto perfection. In chapter 10 and in verse 22, let us draw near. You see, the way he uses let us, he makes himself as part of the people. And he says there's something very important that we need to get into. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us, let us hold fast the confession, the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. Verse 24, and let us, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You see, he brings the challenge to us and he's saying, let us. And whenever he says that, something important to your Christian life, something important to your eternal happiness is about to be said in chapter 12, verse 28. Chapter 12, verse 28, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. We are receiving a kingdom, and that kingdom will be eternal, and that kingdom will never be moved. Therefore, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In uh, chapter 13, verse 13, let us go. He has been talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has been talking about Jesus Christ that he is a sanctifier, and that he may sanctify the people with some blood, he suffered without the gate. What then is my responsibility, our responsibility? Let us go forth, therefore, unto him, outside the camp, without the camp, bearing his uh, reproach. And so you find the challenge. That whenever Paul, uh, the writer of the epistle, there are those who don't accept it's Paul, but uh, with all the evidences we have, we accept Paul as the writer. Now, we, whenever Paul wants to emphasize something that is very, very essential, it says in the epistle to the Hebrews, let us. Now, what is he telling us to come back to chapter 12 and verse 1? Wherefore, see... We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every wage and let us lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He likens the Christian life and he likens the Christian ministry to running a race. And you find that in different parts of the Word of God. That um, the Christian life and the Christian ministry is referred to as a race to be run. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, encumbrances hindering spiritual progress. Or you may say, entanglements hindering spiritual progress. That's what he's telling us to lay aside. It says there are encumbrances, there are entanglements, and there are weights, sins that do so easily beset us. They hinder our spiritual progress, and we are to lay them aside. Number two, example for spiritual pilgrims. The example, looking unto Jesus, considering the Lord, is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the pattern, he is the model, he is the standard, he is the one that has gone before us, he is the example for spiritual pilgrims. Number three, exhortation to steadfast perseverance. Exhortation to steadfast perseverance. Number one, entanglements 
all encumbrances, hindering spiritual progress. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 again, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and let us lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us. Only when we have laid the weights aside, we have laid the sin, the besetting sin aside, can we run with patience the race that is set before us? He is uh, telling us that he has shown us a catalog of examples. He has shown us a cloud of witnesses. He has shown us challenges from the old covenant. And then it's like he's pointing to us. He said, do you see these people? I've shown them to you as heroes of faith. By faith, they did this. By faith, they obeyed. By faith, they performed. By faith, they subdued. By faith, they overcame. By faith, they were able to have children. By faith, they served the Lord. By faith, they were able to endure. All these people have shown you, they had some hindrances. They had some encumbrances. They had some entanglements. But what they did is that they removed them. And if you are going to be able to come into that same catalog of faithful people, you will need to lay aside the wage as well as the sin that does so easily besets. Faith enabled those witnesses to run faithfully and to do all the things the Lord wanted them to do. They were able to do whatever God commanded, however difficult. They were able to endure whatever God appointed, however severe. They were able to obtain whatever God promised, however seemingly unattainable. And the reason they were able to manifest such faith and things that were difficult and things that were almost uh, unattainable, they were able to have is because they laid aside every weight. And every besetting sin, if the saints who lived before our full redemption was accomplished, were able to endure, were able to obey, were able to conquer by faith, shall we not live and obey and conquer too? If they lived under less privileges spiritually, and yet they overcame, why are we not going to overcome? We can overcome. We will overcome. But then we have to follow the rules of the race. If you have been an athlete before, you will know that for everything you do, there is a rule. There is a way to run. And thank God, the rules to be observed. The path which, were to be, which, at, which is to be traversed. And the difficulties which were to overcome. The dangers to be avoided. And the source of needed strength are all plainly described in Scripture. And yet, there's something to lay aside. As he encourages us, as he instructs us, he says, find out in your life, what is that weight? And what have you discovered in your life that keeps on coming and coming and coming? After a retreat, that same thing comes. After a period of personal, powerful revival, that thing comes. After a mighty congress, that thing comes. And every time you watch in the system, in the pattern of your life, you find that that same danger, that same difficulty, that same entanglement, that same temptation, and that same problem is showing up and up and up again to beset you or to distract you or to make you go away from the paths you ought to follow. That's the weight. That's the besetting sin. The one that catches you easily. The one that discourages you easily. The one that saps your energy, dissipates your energy easily. The one that crushes you easily. The one that makes you sick spiritually easily. Find it out. Discover it. And when you discover it, you say, yes, yeah. since I became a Christian, I've been watching the first year, the second year, the third year, until now. 
immediately after there is a great success and I attain a particular spiritual level and I say thank God even if I have not arrived I am arriving now then that thing will come that thing will come find out that thing that is the wage that is a besetting sin. Lay it aside so that after this congress now, you will run the race with patience and you will run successfully in Jesus' name. Now, as we talk in general terms, you will have to find out yourself because the wage for brother A is going to be different from the wage from sister B. The wage for uh, you is going to be different from the besetting sin of the other fellow. Therefore, you have the responsibility of finding out yourself what is the wage that hinders me. What is the besetting sin? The temptation, the difficulty, the sin that the devil knows, he'll be, the devil will be sitting down and watching. He'll be, he will be alert. I'll be running and running and running. I'll be consecrating. I'll be praying. I will be making all my decisions. I'll be saying, oh Lord, this time I will never look back again. I've arrived now. I'm going to do exploits for the Lord. And then the devil will inject that thing. And then you cool down immediately. And you know it. That thing that has been happening like that. That the revival does not remain, does not endure for one week. The revival, the thing that God has done, does not abide, does not remain for one month. It does not last the whole year before the next congress. Find out that witch. Find out that besetting sin. And put them all aside that from now on you will run the race that is set before you. In Songs of Solomon. The songs of Solomon, chapter 2, and in verse 15, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender graves. You see the things that sap your energy, the thing that discourages you, the thing that crushes you, the thing that slows down your pace, the, the things that take away from your consecration. The things that lessens your spiritual fervor. It may not be a very big thing. It may just be the little foxes. Find them out. Discover them. Look back. Take inventory of your life. And see the things that have been making you not to be as fervent, as zealous, as dependable, as faithful, as successful you ought to be in the work of the Lord. The little, little, little foxes. Get rid of them. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. In Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 14. And shall say, Cast ye off, cast ye off, prepare the way, take off the stumbling block out of the way of my people. What the word of God is telling us here is that you've gone this journey before. The journey from repentance, salvation, unto sanctification. You've gone that way before. From sanctification to the Holy Ghost baptism, you've gone that way before. From sitting down and listening and rising up and ministering, you've gone through that journey before from praying and having the power of God upon you and then preaching and reaching out to the people that are waiting. You've gone through that journey before. You've discovered something in every one of those journeys. The stumbling block that the devil put on the way. That at the time of prayer, you will say, I will conquer. I will overcome. I will preach. Those people are going to be converted. I'm going to pray for the sick. I'm going to effect this change. I'm going to effect that transformation. And the church in my location will change. That's the time of prayer. But between the time of praying and the time of preaching, the road that leads from praying to preaching, the journey, you have discovered the stumbling blocks in the way. And you stumbled over those things. Take an inventory and look back. Those are the things to take away because now we have prayed again. We have got the anointing again. We have got the knowledge again. We have got the zeal again. And we're going to take that same journey from the point of preaching to the point of, of uh, from the point of praying to the point of preaching. 
and remember the stumbling blocks of the past. Let us lay aside every weight and lay aside the sin that does so easily beset. You see, others may. I cannot. That thing may not be a stumbling block to other people. For example, you may find that there is a young man, and this young man is not married yet. He's a bachelor, and the Lord is using him. The Lord is using him tremendously and wonderfully. And it, you find out his teenage sister is living with him. To him, there's no problem. To him, that's all right. Because, uh, you know, the junior sister is there. They have the same parents. He doesn't uh, bother him at all. And he's firing on and preaching. And there is nothing that that little girl will tell you ever happens between him and uh, that lady. And uh, you may find that, uh, you know, we have a preacher. And this preacher has a maid. A, you know, young teenage girl at home. Helping them to do this, helping them to do that and all that. And there is nothing bad happening. And that man is still firing on and preaching. But you, you have your junior sister living with you. And you are a bachelor. And every time the devil is making that your junior sister to be the wage and the sin that so easily besets you. Don't tell me that so and so has his junior sister, so I'll keep my own. Well, it's a different case. For him, it is not a wage. For him, it's not a stumbling block. For him, it is not any besetting sin. For you, you know the story. You know that every time you come back from the retreat, you come back from the revival, you come back from the congress, that's the besetting sin. And the devil is waiting here. Before one week or two weeks, you are back again to the time of crying and rolling in the dust. Saying, oh God, when will I be free from this? Why don't you send her away? Or maybe you know that uh, the maid you have helping your family, helping your wife, is the stumbling block. And it's a besetting sin. For many other families, that's not a problem to them. The brother, you know, just comes in and has, has a fellowship with his wife and a fellowship with the children. And the maid over there is not a problem at all. But for you, it's a problem. And you look at your own problem and you say, I don't know about that family. I don't know about that family. For them, it may be all right. But for me, it's a wage. It's a besetting sin. It's a stumbling block. And I don't want to die in rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. I'm going to get rid of the problem. And therefore, you take that stumbling block away. That's what the Bible is saying in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And reading there from verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. There are affairs of this life, the politics of this life, and uh, the things uh, of our natural families. You know, sometimes it becomes an encumbrance. It becomes an entanglement. Every family problem they want to solve in the village, they're inviting you to come and look at it. The problem on land. The problem of disagreement between this family and your family. The problem that relates with the chief, village chief and uh, your people. Uh, the problem of uh, the plantation of your grandfather that died 20 years ago. And now it's coming up again in the court. At the time you ought to be preaching, they say that uh, you should always come. And you are entangled with the affairs of this life. You are entangled with all the things happening in the extended family. And uh, this one, cousin, will bring uh, their young fellow. Uh, this one will be living with you. And uh, auntie will bring uh, her daughter. This one will be living with you. You have uh, four children. You have five other people from extended family living with you. Making nine all together. You are supposed to pay their school fees. You are supposed to feed them. You are supposed to find accommodation for them. And all of you, you have two rooms. And uh, your own sons, boys, and all those girls... You pack them into one room, and then you hear bad stories happening. And then it disturbs your conscience. You are not able to preach. Entanglement. Encumbrance. 
the weights that are pressing you down, dragging you back. And uh, the things you know that I need to solve this problem. If I don't solve this problem, and I have all this wagon from the villages, from the extended family following after me, I will never be able to get anything done. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. You make sure that you push everything aside. Matthew chapter 5. From verse 28. Matthew 5, verse 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, it may be that there is a particular person that is so near to you. And this applies to women. You may be a woman. And uh, you know that there is a man, that she, he is an object of temptation to you. Whenever you think about him, it goes beyond ordinary thinking. It affects your emotion. It affects your feeling. There's danger there. Or maybe you are a man. Even when that woman is not around, whenever you think about her, it goes beyond ordinary thinking. It affects your emotion. It affects your feeling. And uh, you become absent-minded. Your train of thought is disturbed, especially if she passes. She walks a particular way. She dresses a particular way. And she's doing it maybe to entice you and to get your attention. It uh, removes your mind from the thing, your goal, the line, the race you need to run. You know, that's danger. And then instead of concentrating upon the Lord, you are looking the wrong direction, looking away from your wife and looking at a strange woman. And what the Lord says is the same thing, laying aside every wage. Laying aside the sin that does so easily beset you. In verse 29, And if thy right hand offend thee, that is somebody very close to you, like a right hand, but now it's a stumbling block to your life. And it's going to make you deviate from the call of God upon your life. It says, If your right hand offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. We're looking at uh, these words because these are the things that generally have destroyed the things we knew before, the things we learned before. First Timothy chapter 6, from verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. They that will be rich, the people that want money by all means. Money at all costs. Whatever it will take, they must get that money. They that must be rich will be rich. They fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Therefore, you understand, it may be that after we have come to a congress like this, uh, you'll be making up your mind, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. Immediately you get back home, then the business associates and the business partners and the business colleagues, they come, they say, where have you been? Oh, I went for Congress one whole week at the beginning of the year. Don't you know this is a time market is selling very well? And then you pack all your Bible aside and all the notes aside. And then you want to meet up with the people that had been selling all through this one week. You want to get the money by all costs. And you are making contacts. You want to travel to Japan. You want to go to Korea. You want to go to Singapore. You want to go and get all this electronics equipment and come over here to sell. By the time you get involved in that for one month, everything you had here, not a drop remains. You've gone. Because you see, that love of money, the root of all evil, that is the thing that you will, uh, that will be chasing after your life. And as the thing is chasing after your life, you even forget everything. And uh, it may be that you are looking for those uh, business contacts. And while we are here in this uh, Congress, you have been uh, searching, where are the people that came from America? 
where the people that came from uh, outside Africa and uh, all those white people from Eastern Europe can I get the address can I talk to them uh, because uh, I learned that uh, this kind of commodity is cheaper on their side this kind of commodity is cheaper on their side and I'm going to talk to them uh, so that if I get the address I'll be writing to them writing to them and tell them I am deep alive I was in the conference where you shared that night and what you shared that night it was the best message I ever had in that Congress I can still remember now how you were standing there how you gave your testimony how you were converted by those uh, Nigerians in fact the Spirit of God is leading me to you now the man wants to do business that's why you have all the flattery and he's trying to get the address he's trying to have this so that he will leave all the sin the Lord has planted in his heart he's running out for money and he's looking for visa and he's looking for passport and while looking for visa looking for passport and everything he will tell a lot of lies he will lose his salvation he will lose his relationship with god because of wanting to travel not to preach although he will tell them i want to come and preach there i've been having the vision the revelation the dream before you even in fact i was surprised while you were standing there i had seen you in my dream before exactly as you are looking now i saw you like that before don't mind him is a businessman and that's the thing that you know makes people to lose their experiences they lose the life and the fire and the zeal of god upon their lives if you find out that in your own life that is how things have been in the past that whenever we come for a congress like this those contacts those addresses those uh, you want to do business and all that they take away from you the thing that was planted in you you will be careful you will lay aside the wage you will lay aside the sin that does so easily beset you i pray god will give us the victory now we go to point number two the example of for spiritual pilgrims already the apostle has told us in uh, chapter 12 of hebrews and in verse 1 and he tells us wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a crowd a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight every weight every weight and let us lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience. It will need endurance. It will need patience. It will need fortitude. It will need strength. It will need courage. It will need determination that you just keep on running. You are getting tired. You keep on running. You keep on running. You keep on running. Running the race that is set before us. Now it comes to the example. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto jesus this uh, verse is telling us that jesus christ is the supreme example and the perfect pattern for us to follow looking unto jesus our eyes are to be fixed on jesus not on the cloud of witnesses as you look at those clouds of witnesses you may see some shortcomings now their faith has been put before us as the thing to challenge us but then you may see that as you think about Abraham and as you think even about Samuel because he had unbelieving riotous children. And as you think about Jephthah and as you think about Samson, as you think about David, although their faith had been lifted up for us to see, yet you will see there might have been a birch. There might have been an unfortunate incident in their lives. So he says, look at their faith, don't look beyond that. Look at their faith, don't look underneath that. Look at their faith and don't look aside from them because if you look beyond their faith and beneath their faith, you may see things you shouldn't that will not encourage you. But then he says, that's enough, you're done. Not looking now, looking unto Jesus. This one, you can look at his faith. You can look at his faithfulness. You can look at his patience. You can look at his love. You can look at his internal life. You can look at his external life. You can look at everything about his life. His relationship with the Father. His attitude to the work. His faithfulness unto God. You can look at everything concerning him. He's the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. 
a time comes in your life when you will have to stop looking at Abraham. A time comes in your life when you will have to stop looking at David. A time comes when you will have to stop looking at something. And then you now concentrate your gaze. You fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as the captain is greater than the servant, even so, Jesus Christ is greater than all those people. From him, we derive inspiration and courage and strength. The life which Jesus lived on earth is our perfect model. As we look at Jesus, as we think about Jesus, as we consider the Lord Jesus Christ, we see he himself, he looked away from all discouragements and difficulties. And uh, he committed himself, he committed his life, he committed his mission, everything on earth, unto the Lord who had sent him, whose will he had come to fulfill. And he says, we need to look unto Jesus. As we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, how do we do that? You look at Jesus constantly. Constantly. Every time in your life, any time in your life, whatever you are going through, constantly look unto Jesus. Number two, trust fully. You look unto him trustfully. Now the things that will accomplish him, he has the power to transmit that power and faith into your life so that you'll be able to do what he has done. You look at him, number three, submissively. You look at him saying, oh Lord, I'm looking at you, waiting on you so that I can receive instruction from you. You are looking constantly. You are looking trustfully. You are looking submissively. Number four, you are looking lovingly. You love him. And you don't find any blemish in him. He is purer than the purest on earth. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily of the valley. He is the great, the perfect one. He is the one in whom there is no sin. He is the representation of the Father. You see the glories and the beauty on him while you are looking at him. And you look on him lovingly. You look on him with all your heart. Your heart is occupied with him. And your heart is staying on him, waiting on him. The whole secret of acceptance and the whole secret of practical Christian living is looking unto the Lord. Now the Bible tells us we mustn't look in the wrong direction. And if you know those who have been running, if you have run in any race before, you keep on looking at the target. You look, keep on looking at the finishing point, the finishing post. So that you fix your eyes on the goal, on the destination of that race. You don't look at the people that are running on your side. You don't look at your feet. You don't look behind. You keep on looking straight forward at the finishing point. And that's why the word of God tells us how we're to keep on looking. Number one, it says, look not behind thee, lest thou be consumed. Keep on looking forward. He is beyond. He is before. He is in front. Look at him. Look not behind thee. Two, we are told no man. These are the words of Jesus. Having put his son to the plow and looking back, his feet for the kingdom of God. Don't look behind you to the things of the world, to Sodom and Gomorrah as Sodom is burning, to the treasures of the world. Don't look back to those things. Don't look behind you. And when you have laid your hand on the plow, don't go back on your consecration. Don't say, well, I discovered that and my extended family is now having a hold on me. And I want to go and prepare for the burial, funeral, whatever, of my father. If you lay your hands on the plow and you look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature. There are some people you look at and they intimidate you. They make you afraid. And they have a kind of look, they have a kind of posture, they have a kind of attitude. And you can see that through their face. And uh, they want to intimidate you, to tell you, you can't do this, you can't move forward, you can't consecrate, you can't follow your conviction. They want to control your conviction. And if you have been in the Congress like this, and we have uh, read the word of God together, you've got some real convictions, and you're going back, 
They may even support, they are supposed to be Christians, these people. And uh, when you get back and you are in your location and you want to follow after that conviction the Lord has planted in your heart, the way they posture, the way they want to address you, it is to tell you that, uh, don't bring that con Congress uh, conviction here. That's Lagos. That's Nigeria. Don't bring that one here. If you are going to remain here, and I am the one going to give you responsibility, don't bring that one here. And when you look at them, the way they tell you and the way they say it, you're no more looking at Jesus Christ. All your convictions will evaporate. They're no more there. You'll only be a crushed man inside. A disappointment to yourself, a disappointment to God. But it says you'll be looking on Jesus, you will not look at their countenance. And then it says in Second Corinthians 4, 8, well, we sin, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And it says, look not every man on his own thing. Don't be looking at your advantage. You see, that's what makes you perseveringly to the very end. I pray that the Lord who has called us and the Lord who has brought the example before us, he will help us to the very end in Jesus' name. In uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And in verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Look unto Jesus. Look at his example. The way he preached. The way he did the will of the Father. The way he surrendered. The way he did not come to do his own will. The way he taught. The things he taught. And the things he did. We are to look at his example and we are to follow that example, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, let's look at Jesus, consider, ponder over, meditate on the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house, therefore consider him. Live like him. He was faithful. Be faithful. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Follow his steps. Your preaching, your doctrine, your emphasis, your lifestyle, your leadership role, your leadership style. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. First John chapter 2 and in verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself so to walk, even as he walked. If you say you are following the Lord, then walk as he walked. Do the things that he did. Let his word, let his lifestyle be the thing that you are looking at every time that is looking unto Jesus. Now, why are we looking unto Jesus? Come back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're reading now from verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the author of our faith. He's the originator of our faith. He's the very source of our faith. And then that word finisher means the completer. The one that completes our faith. It's the one that matures our faith. It's the one that develops our faith. It's one that increases and lifts up the level of our faith. We're looking unto him. Why? Because faith is so essential in our lives. We have looked at chapter 11 and we have seen that all those people, they were what they were and they pleased God by faith. If we are going to please the Lord, we need faith. And Jesus is the author. 
and Jesus is the source and Jesus is the originator of the faith and is the maturer, is the developer, is the finisher, is the completer of our faith. That's why we're looking unto him. If you look unto man, your faith will even decrease. You have been believing God, I will live a holy life, I will live a righteous life. And then you look at something. Then you say, I don't think I can make it. I don't think I can be as holy as I was desiring. If you look at man, the faith you had before, thinking, I will do this, I will accomplish this, I will run the race that is set before me. The moment you look at a man and you see their example, you see their lifestyle, discouragement will come and your faith level will go down. And you'll say, I don't think I can achieve, I can accomplish, I can do it. But now, when you look unto Jesus, the author of your faith, the finisher of your faith. That faith will be developing. What are we to look at in Jesus? Verse 2. Who for the joy that was set before him. The joy that was set before him. He had difficulty. He didn't think of the difficulty. He thought of the joy that was set before him. He had opposition. He didn't think of the opposition. He thought of the joy before him. He was always thinking at the end of the race. At the end, when I pay the redemption price. At the end, when I give my life blood. At the end, when I've done and I've finished what the Lord wants me to do. He looked at the joy of having many, many people in the kingdom of God. He looked at the joy of having myriads and millions of people in heaven eventually. He looked at the joy among the angels that his sacrifice will accomplish because of all the result of his sacrifice on the cross. He looked at the joy that was set before him. That's what you are to do as well. You look at the final reward. You look at God saying, well done. You look at uh, the joy awaiting when you get to heaven. You say, well, the present difficulties are there. The present uh, kind of persecutions are there. And I am confronted by many things in the ministry, but I don't look at them. I'm looking at the joy that is set before me. Because of that, he endured the cross. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now he sat down on the right hand of God. He sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Can you see there, there are four things that we are told. And these four things about the Lord. Number one, we are told that he had a reason. He had a motive which prompted him to do all that he did and to suffer all that he suffered. He was always concentrating not on the present sorrow, on the joy. Not on the present suffering, on the joy, the future joy. Not on the present predicament and problem, on the future joy. He had a motive and a reason that prompted him to suffer everything that he suffered, the anticipation or that final glorious joy, after accomplishing the appointed task, made him to fully obey God. And that's what we're to do. We're to keep our eyes on the final reward and the final joy before us. Number two, he now endured the cross. Here we have the commander's example of heroic fortitude. Before his soldiers, he endured the cross, he endured the pain of crucifixion, with holy composure of the soul. No wavering, no murmuring, no regretting, no complaining. And he has left us an example that we should follow his steps. There will be a cross to endure. And sometimes it may be a little bit heavy. And if it were not a little bit heavy, it will not be a cross. If it brought pleasure, it will not be a cross. If it is totally convenient, it will not be a cross. You have a cross to bear. Bear it like the Lord Jesus Christ and don't complain about the pain. And don't complain and don't murmur and don't, uh, uh, don't waver because of the inconvenience or because of the load. Number three, he despised the shame. Of course, it was a shame. Because it was a shameful kind of death to be hanging on the cross. He died like a criminal and yet not for his own sin. He died for your sin and my sin. There will be times you are accused of something you have never done. There are times that you have taught everything you know to teach 
and then your congregation they have not responded well and uh, the blame of your immature congregation will come upon you well you have to despise the shame and just go ahead here we see the captain's contempt for the world's criticisms and comments you see the comments came they even told him come down from the cross and we will believe you. He disregarded the hardship, the ignominy, the persecution, the insult, the suffering from men. He counted them as trifles. And then the scorn of men will not be magnified in his mind. He did not even think about them. He was not intimidated by the shame. In that too, he is our example. You don't care what people say. You despise the shame. You ignore the shame. The ignominy, the insult. The way they look at you, the way they talk about you, the way they gossip about you, the criticisms, unjust criticism they bring upon you, you just ignore the shame. Number four, now he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here we see the captain's triumph, rest after finished work. We see his dominion as he occupies now the place of supreme sovereignty and authority. And then we see that he has now the prerogative of judgment. He is now the one to judge the quick and the dead, to judge all people. And we're told that as he did, neglecting, looking away from the shame, from the ignominy, from the evil things they said, all the things, he looked away, he was looking at the joy that was set before him alone. That is the thing we have to do. We we'll come to the last point. Point number three, exhortation to steadfast perseverance. Verses three and four, for consider him. He's still telling us, don't look away from Jesus yet, we have not finished. Don't look away from the author and the finisher of your faith yet, we have not finished. Yeah, I've told you, look on him, look unto him. I'm not telling you, consider him. Consider him, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He said, if you don't look at Jesus, if you don't consider Jesus Christ, many things will happen on the way that will make you to feel discouraged. And then he says, you'll be wearied in your mind, you will faint in your mind. Believers here have been exhorted, look unto Jesus and consider him, emulate him, follow him, pattern your life after his steadfastness. In verse 1, we are told, lay aside every weight. In verse 3, we are told, lay aside contradiction of sinners, the people that oppose you. The sinners that oppose you, they will even be contradicting themselves, among themselves. And yet, everybody is believing the contradictory statements they are saying about you. Just forget about that. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. The people that opposed the Lord, they contradicted themselves a lot. And yet, the high priest believed the contradiction of those liars and sinners. And yet, Jesus will not utter a word. Look unto Jesus. Consider Jesus Christ. He endured the contradiction of sinners. Don't argue. Don't try to build up an empire for yourself. Don't try to uh, build up reputation for yourself. Don't try to answer all your critics and everything they are saying. Sometimes the people, uh, they want us to leave uh, the things that the Lord has called us to do. They say, don't you hear what they are saying about you? Don't you hear what they are saying about you? Answer and uh, make a response. Because uh, we people are trying to defend you that you are not like that, you are not like that. And even you, we are defending you are quiet. Yes, the Lord has not sent us to preach ourselves. He has sent us to preach Jesus Christ. Therefore, don't defend yourself. Don't go about with another ministry now. The ministry of exalting self, exonerating self, and the ministry of protecting self. That all those things, they are contradiction of sinners. Leave all that alone and consider Jesus who endured quietly, patiently, the contradiction of sinners 
against himself. Now you will see that as you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, every day and every time, you will not fight for yourself. You are there only to do the will of our Father who is in heaven. And I pray you will do it in Jesus' name. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6 and verse 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's why he never bothered about trying to put right and put straight the contradiction of those sinners against himself. All he did was just to leave everything in the hands of God. And as he bore the cross, you are to bear the cross. Have you forgotten that uh, the higher you go, the heavier your cross ought to become? If you are a leader, understand, uneasy lies the head that wears what? The crown. And uh, that goes with leadership. It goes with leadership that there are backsliders and sinners that will be contradicting themselves. All the contradiction is heaped upon you. And you are not supposed to leave the real ministry. And you are not supposed to leave the preaching of the gospel. And now begin to preach yourself. You never defend yourself. You just concentrate on the word of God. You are in the ministry. Not to do your own will, but to do the will of him that sent you. There will be a cross for you to bear. I pray you will bear it gallantly, courageously, and boldly. Without ever looking back in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. Every day there is a part of the cross you have to bear. And follow me. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. That he whosoever will say, that cross is becoming too heavy. That difficulty is becoming too weighty for me. And this contradiction of sinners is uh, now disturbing me. I cannot bear any of these anymore. And I'm going to save my face and save my life and save my name and save my personality and deliver myself uh, from all these people that are going to run me, that are trying to run me down. And my reputation is at stake. Look at it, verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage or profited if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? That's the reason you'll just keep on looking unto the Lord. Well, bearing the cross will mean sometimes suffering wrongfully. Uh -uh, Jesus suffered wrongfully. They nailed him to the cross. That was wrong. He wasn't to be blamed. He had not done anything wrong. He was only carrying the blame and the sin of other people, bearing the sin of the nation. And the people knew it, and he knew it, and he knew that he had not done anything wrong. And yet, he committed his soul and his life unto the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Today, there are people that don't even want to suffer for their sin. They don't want to be disciplined for their sin. They don't want to be rebuked for their error, for their evil. And if you correct them and rebuke them and chastise them, discipline them for their fault, they cannot bear it. Not to talk of when you are perfect, when you are holy, when you are righteous, when you are effective, when you are fervent, when you are zealous, when you are a beloved person and you have not done a single thing wrong, and yet you suffer for doing well. If you cannot bear suffering when you do wrong, how will you bear to suffer when you do right? Look at Jesus. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. He suffered after he had done everything well. The Bible says he has done all things well. He makes the blind to see. He makes the deaf to hear. He has done all things well. At the end of it, he suffered for it. And yet, he bore it courageously. Without any complaint. 
And as we're considering Jesus, you are considering Jesus to live like Jesus lived. Verse 19 again, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endured grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently, you are wrong, you have sinned, you are backsliding, you have been negligent, you have not done well, you have not ministered well, and you are corrected. If you bear that patiently, well, what else would you have done? That's the normal thing to do. What glory is that? What boasting is that? Can you be proud and say, I did wrong, and when they rebuked me, I bore it patiently. There is no glory in that. You are suffering, you are being rebuked for what you did wrong. But now, on the other hand, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto what ye call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we shall follow his stairs. So you can see that what the Lord is saying is that you will continue with the Lord. Even though you may suffer, even though people may say some things against you. Now come back to Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, we are being encouraged by the writer. And he has told us that all the people that he has mentioned in the epistle to the Hebrews... Because uh, from the first chapter, he has been talking about uh, how better the new covenant is. And he has been exalting Jesus Christ. And if you go through the epistle, he's been telling us that Jesus Christ is the express image of the Father. That he is greater than the angels in chapter 1. He's greater than the priest, and he's greater than Moses, and he's greater than Joshua, and he's greater than the high priest Aaron. He's greater than Melchizedek. He's greater than all the Levites. He's greater than Abraham. And then he comes into chapter 11, and he mentions a lot of people. He said, he's greater than them all. At a lifting up Jesus Christ, he said, if you want to run the race before you, and if you want to run not getting tired, you want to continue perseveringly until the finishing point, I've lifted Jesus up for you to see. Now look unto Jesus. As you get back uh, home from the Congress, anytime tiredness comes, look unto Jesus. Anytime they blaspheme and uh, they say something wrong about you, don't talk. Look unto Jesus. Anytime you are sick, I pray you will not be sick. Look unto Jesus. Anytime there is any contradiction of sinners and the evil people are planning against you, don't fight in human weapon. Look unto Jesus. Anytime it appears that the revival fire is going down, the zeal is going down, the commitment is going down, look unto Jesus. Anytime you preach and there is no power in that preaching, look unto Jesus. Anytime you counsel, you do not have revelation, illumination to know what you are going to tell the people. Look Look unto Jesus. Anytime it appears that your workers are dropping out and you are being disappointed by the lifestyle of your workers, look unto Jesus. Anytime it appears that some of the faithful people in your congregation, they have some needs in their lives. A faithful brother, a faithful sister, he doesn't have child yet and uh, or he's not married yet or he's uh, out of job. The people, they committed, the faithful people, and you say, oh God, what? never ask why, never complain. Look unto Jesus. Anytime you're looking for something, you know, you need land and you need a building and you need all these things to carry on the work of God and the thing is not there, look unto Jesus. Anytime temptation comes and the devil is saying, this one, there's no way you will fall in this one. I will catch you in this one. I'm going to bundle you in this one. Immediately you commit this sin. I'm going to kill you and throw you. And, and God is going to reject you. And bundle you into it. Look unto Jesus. Anytime it appears that in the dream. The occultic people and the demonic people. They come to you in the dream. They say, ah, you come from a place. Mount of transfiguration. And you come to scatter us and disturb us here. We will show you. You wake up in the morning. Don't cry. Don't say you're afraid. Look unto Jesus and anytime it appears now your work is coming to an end you are getting old 
And then you are getting the, to the border of River Jordan. And you are about to cross River Jordan. And cross, cross to the other side, the land of promise, the land of plenty, the land of possession. The land where the Lord Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. So that where I am, ye will be also. And you know that the last hour is coming. The last moment is coming. You are about to cross over to the other side. And you're expecting Jesus to be standing to receive you. The angels will be there to welcome you. The redeemed of the Lord will be there to welcome you. At that time, don't look at the work you have done. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at your fault. No, it is by grace we cross that Jordan and move to the other side. That final hour, that final moment when the final joy and reward and crown is to be given unto you. Look unto Jesus. What I'm saying is from this point to that point. From this starting point to the destination, keep on looking unto Jesus. He will hold your hand. He will not disappoint you. He will be a hedge around you. He will be a wall of fire around you. If you keep on looking, don't look at the lion. Don't look at the devil. Don't look at the sorcerers. Don't look at the tempters. Don't look at the difficulties. Don't look behind you. Keep on looking unto Jesus. And if the trumpet sounds, while we're looking up like this, all of us will be caught up to meet him in the air. Stand up and tell the Lord, I'll keep on looking unto Jesus. I'll keep on looking unto Jesus. Is the author and the finisher of my faith. The author and the finisher of my faith. The author and the finisher of my faith. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Don't look at man. Don't look at woman. Don't look at Samson. Don't look at Abraham. Don't look at David. Don't look at anyone. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Look at him. Look on him. Consider him. It's our Lord. It's a source of our strength. It's our power in the day of struggle and battle. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the everlasting arm underneath us. He's our shepherd. He's our deliverer. He's our helper. He's our sustainer. He's our counselor. He's the lifter up of our head. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the sanctifier. He's the purifier. He's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the one that will never fail forever. He's ever the same. The same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. He's the power of God in man. Jesus in me, the hope of glory. Keep on looking at him. In the days of battle, look at Jesus. In the days of weakness, look at Jesus. In the days of problem, look at Jesus. In the days of need, look at Jesus. In the time of temptation, look at Jesus. In the day of discouragement, look at Jesus. In the time of sickness, look at Jesus. In the time of oppression, look at Jesus. In a time when the devil is making you afraid, look at Jesus. In a time of barrenness, look at Jesus. In a time of ministration, look at Jesus. In a time of prayer and fasting, look at Jesus. In a time of need, look at Jesus. And when a final day will come, when a final day will come, when a final day will come, and you are about to cross River Jordan and cross over to the other side, keep on looking unto Jesus. In the vehicle, you look unto Jesus. At home, you look unto Jesus. In the church, you look unto Jesus.